I seem to remember there's a moment at the end where he's hanging onto the cliff um, and they eventually push him off. And as they push him off, the whole audience stood up, bar one, <laughs> and roared. <laughs> stood up and roared. And I thought, he wasn't that bad. I was the only person <laughs> sitting there watching them all, <laughs> roaring with clapping. Uh, so hurtful. The, uh, the voice that you found for Klaus von Bülow, I know, was very important. I'm interested, though, in how fun it was to voice Scar in The Lion King. And did it scare your young son, Max, when he actually finally saw the film? Because he was about nine or ten when the film came out. He was, yeah. He was, yeah. Uh, was it a lot of fun to, to, to voice that character, and did it, did it freak Max out? Well, it was extraordinary. I mean, I'd never, I'd never made a, a voice for D D yeah. Disney before, and I was working in Stratford at the Shakespeare Company at the time when they asked, and, and, and I thought, oh, well, I'm gonna put on a voice to a cartoon, oh, okay. And I went along expecting to see the finished film and me having to sort of put lines into mouths that were moving in a certain way. Um, but it's not like that at all. You sit there with a script, but they, they've got a storyboard around the room, so you sort of see the story that's gonna happen, um, but very roughly painted. And uh, and then they give you the script, and you you know you try a bit of that, and then you play around with it, and you alter stuff, and you come up with stuff, and you suggest stuff, and meanwhile there are people videoing you with a camera, and 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 drawing you, um, you know artists drawing you, and, and and all of this, and you're playing around, and then two months later you meet again wherever you are in Toronto or whatever they'll come to you there the whole team comes and they've got a little bit more worked out and they played with the script a bit more and you put some other stuff on tape and um, and this girl I suppose I met them about six times over a year uh, and uh, th then they come up with the film and of course I was absolutely devastated because you know they've been videoing me and drawing me for all that time and I see the film, and there's this scrawny bloody lion. <laughs> I look at James Earl Jones, and he's golden and big mane. James Earl Jones is bald, big mane, he ripples. And I thought, what's the matter with me? Why have I got to look like that? And there was a tail, a tail that looks as if you know, people have been pulling hair out of it for 100 years. And I was very, very hurt. And then I went to see it at Radio City Music Hall when we opened it. And, and when there's a moment at the end, I haven't seen it for years, but I seem to remember there's a moment at the end where he's hanging onto the cliff um, and they eventually push him off. And as they push him off, the whole audience stood up, bar one, <laughs> and roared. <laughs> stood up and roared. And I thought, he wasn't that bad. I was the only person <laughs> sitting there watching them all, <laughs> roaring with clapping. Uh, so hurtful. <laughs> Well, it is, of course, also not, not the only blockbuster you did from that era. Die Hard with a Vengeance also came out a few years later. Alfred Hitchcock said the more successful the villain, the more successful the movie. Uh, that movie was a big success. Was it a kick to do, Die Hard with a Vengeance? Uh, it was great. It was great. John McTiernan was our director. He left me alone, which was wonderful, apart from one day when he came and said, do you think the audience is going to be able to understand that? And I, I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, do you think the accent's maybe a bit strong? I said, okay, fine. He said, I don't want to tell you anything else, it's perfect. Um, I don't know anything about acting, and you're doing great. Uh, and he went away behind the camera, and that was the only uh, note I had, and I loved him for it. Um, and, uh, and I thought it was a great look, actually. I was really happy with I, I worked out like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I mean, I've never worked out before or since like that. No, Buffing. Like uh, after the yeah, No, the was that after the scrawny, or was it before? It was after. Yeah. It was after, yeah, was it? Was Right, everything merges at my age. Uh, and the uh, blue T-shirt I thought was a piece of brilliance. And the blonde hair, and I know it worked because in Bruce's next film, he wore a very similar blue T-shirt <laughs> and he bleached his hair. <laughs> so, um, but it was a lot of fun to do. This year you've had a couple of amazing performances. Uh, Avery Brundage in Race and in The Man Who Knew Infinity, which we saw a clip of here. G.H. Hardy, who you play in The Man Who Knew Infinity. Uh, a mathematician, a very interesting guy, very, very uh, quirky, interesting character. What, uh, what were some of the keys to you for him? The keys to him? Well, um, it, it's a story about mathematician, well, uh, an Indian mathematician really called R Ramanujan who is brought over to Cambridge by this other mathematician, G.S. Uh, Hardy. Um, 
And I was offered the script by Mr. Pressman, Ed Pressman, one of our great producers who's sitting at the back, and I think who deserves a round of applause because he just bought me a vodka. <laughs> Um, and, and Ed, who produced Reversal of Fortune, which had done well by me and, he'd, uh, and I'd done well by him, um, sent me the script and, and, and I read it and uh, I, I knew nothing about it. And I thought, it's always great when you find a story that is true and that you know nothing about, and about a subject you know nothing about. And a very strange relationship between an Indian genius, a young Indian mathematical genius, and a rather crusty, uh, middle-aged uh, Cambridge uh, mathematician of some note in 1913 and the way the relationship develops through their shared passion of mathematics and I thought well that's very interesting and Ed does take care of pictures and he introduced me to his director Matt Brown who was very inexperienced but who had enormous passion to make this um, and I warmed to him and to his passion, and, and so I thought I'd love to be part of that story. And um, Dev Patel uh, was cast as um, Ramanujan, and he's a lot of fun, and can be more serious than in Mar Marigold Ho Hotel or uh, <laughs> Slumdog Millionaire, um, a lovely actor. And we shot in all the right locations. I mean, we shot in Cambridge, first time any film crew's been allowed into Cambridge, because they were so proud of Hardy and Ramanujan, they wanted to tell that story and therefore let us in to do so. So it looks beautiful and it's a it's an extraordinary story in that it's very, very emotional. It's a very simple film, rather old fashioned film. Um, but it's somebody said to me last night, Do you know this is a six handkerchief film? <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Or you, as you would say here, because you don't know the word handkerchief, tissue. <laughs> six <laughs> tissue film. It sounds like that was a surprise to you because it's a very cerebral movie, but it is very emotional. It's very yeah. intimate in so many ways, right? Yeah. yeah. The other the other thing about the film, which is which is really beautiful, is that it's a it's sort of about the aesthetics of mathematics in a sense, and and in and in effect, Hardy also wrote a book sort of about that, the mathematician's apology. That's right. I mean, for me, mathematics had always been very very boring. Yeah. I wasn't good at it. Um, you know, I thought three and three is six. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> but it, it didn't do much. Um, and then I read The Mathematician's Apology, which if any of you have any interest in mathematics, read, because it's extraordinary. And it, you, you realize that pure mathematics is actually not far akin from poetry and from art and from that wonderful discovery of, of looking for, I, how can I say, how can I say something as a poet would think? How can I say it simply? How, how can I say it so it makes sense? And, and pure mathemat ma mathematicians think about m mathematics in the same way. So it's just another language. It's like Italian, which I can't speak. Uh, I can't speak maths either. But if you can speak maths, then uh, uh, you know you're searching for ideas, and 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 they they feel all those theorems and equations are out there in the ether, and all they have to do is to discover them. And when I when I found that attitude, written by this man Hardy in his book. I thought, oh, I can play that. That's, that's fine. I know about that sort of search, that sort of passion for one subject. Um, and, and it gave me the in to him. But it's, it's a delightful film, I think. <laughs> ¶¶